Hi, I'm Paul McGuire, and we're going to continue on talking about how God, the infinite personal living God of the universe, can literally step into your life personally, on a personal basis, and God can supernaturally intervene in your life if you will call upon his name. Now, I personally, theologically, am not a, and I don't claim to know all the answers, so don't, I, I do not want to be guilty of theological pride and kind of insinuate that I have all the answers, because I don't. I'm just telling you what I think. It's my personal opinion. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. But I think that um, it's obvious that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that uh, the Holy Spirit comes inside you. So every believer who's born again, who's put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and has prayed the sinner's prayer, and has invited Christ into their life, you're born again, and when you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside you. Therefore, every person who's born again has the Holy Spirit living inside them. So, this, this uh, theology of uh, a second work of grace, or whatever, that's what they call it. I have some problems with that. But I haven't come to a conclusion, because like I said, I don't claim to know everything. All I do know is what I've seen through years of observation, and this is what I've seen through years of observation. That's, I've had the opportunity to work closely and personally with many of the greatest Christian leaders of our time, many who have passed on to be with the Lord. And many of the greatest Christian leaders who are still alive now or who have passed on to be with the Lord um, were born again. They did not speak in tongues. They did not believe in any second work of grace or baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were born again and they had the Spirit of God in them. And I'm talking, these are people that I worked with, most of them I worked with one-on-one, -on -one, or I knew well. And these were men, great men of God who endorsed my ministry personally. People like Dr. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. He was not, quote, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He did not speak in tongues. But the evidence of his spirit-filled life could fill volumes, Okay. Billy Graham never claimed to speak in tongues or be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The evidence of Billy Graham's uh, spirit-filled life could fill volumes. Uh, Dr. D. James Kennedy, a great man of God, who used to come on my radio show all the time to defend me in front of the pastors because I would take strong stands. He'd spend hours defending me and hours vouching for my ministry. Dr. D. James Kennedy... Uh, most likely Calvinist theology, did not believe in speaking in tongues, did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was clearly filled with the Holy Spirit. And you could go on and on and on naming Dr. Francis Schaeffer, the man who made the, the deepest impression on my theology. And the, and the person I would say, without question, in my opinion, and I've studied the lives of so-called contemporary prophets, both the false prophets, the maybe false prophets, the uh, so-called real prophets, the whole spectrum. Dr. Francis Schaeffer, in my opinion, without exception, was, if you're going to use the term prophet, the greatest prophet to the body of Christ in the last hundred years, bar none. But he didn't speak in tongues, and he was born again, and the Spirit of God was clearly with him. So there were so many people like that. And then there are those who are, who, who talk about a baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Like one of my spiritual fathers, probably my closest spiritual father, that I worked in with him in the ministry one way or the other for 
30 years, and that's Dr. Jack Hayford. But Dr. Jack Hayford distanced himself from crazy charismaticness and crazy Pentecostalism and softened it with terms like the spirit-filled life, etc. Because he recognized just what I'm telling you. And uh, I had the privilege of being the main editor in, in most of the main categories for him in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible for students. So Jack Hayford had balance. Um, but Jack Hayford also did Jack Hayford also did teach and believe in being filled with the Spirit. And he also believed in, um, he modified the words, he didn't use the word speaking in tongues. He called it speaking, I think he ended up calling it speaking in your heavenly language. No, or praying in the Spirit, something like that. And it wasn't that he was, in, he, the, the problem is, you see, speaking in tongues uh, is one of these heavy baggage words where people think of a bunch of crazies babbling incoherently in the middle of the service and disrupting the service. I'm not picking on Pentecostalism and Charismatics. The, the, the greatest move of God. See, I don't agree with people who have dismissed Azusa Street as being a false revival. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Maybe there are tributaries of the streams that came out of the Azusa Street revival that did go into false prophecy. I'm not saying that that didn't happen. But you can't tell me that all those people filled with the Holy Spirit in Azusa Street, which impacted billions of people across planet Earth, uh, it was a counterfeit revival. Because the, the, the testimonies, David Wilkerson for one, uh, just amazing testimonies of what good came out of it. So you can't live the Christian life without being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, um, the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost because they were all gathered in one place with one accord. And then it says in verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. A better translation would be they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in my own personal ministry, I do not like to promote tongues. Uh, I don't speak in tongues publicly or out loud because uh, it is a distraction and it is a stumbling block for non-believers and believers. When they hear people speaking in tongues, uh, it's disruptive, it's chaotic, and it frightens them. I'm not embarrassed about a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to do anything in my ministry that will erect a stumbling block from somebody coming uh, deeper to Jesus. I have nothing against being filled with the Holy Spirit. Without being filled with the Holy Spirit, I couldn't do anything. But um, one of the great men of God that I had the privilege of uh, becoming very good friends with before he uh, uh, went home to be with the Lord uh, was Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. I spoke at... Uh, one, a bunch of Calvary Chapel uh, prophecy conferences, and I spoke for, uh, I was one of the keynote speakers uh, f for Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, along with General Jerry Boykin and a whole bunch of people. Uh, I think Joel Rosenberg was there, I don't remember. Anyway, I became good friends with Chuck Smith, unbeknownst to many of the Calvary Chapel leaders, because I would simply drive to his office at the Calvary Chapel Church. We talked on the phone, uh, and then we would spend hours together. He very nice to me. He took me out to lunch, and we talked about deep things. He wanted to hear what I had to say because I had things that, that he needed to hear, and he had a lot to teach me. 
But I remember the one thing that Calvary Chapel instituted in their churches, which I thought was wise, and that is they were never heavy-handed about the, the tongue stuff. And that came from Chuck Smith. Because um, they believed it created confusion that when people would stand up and speak in tongues all at the same time in public, and that was counterproductive uh, to winning people to Jesus Christ. And that was Chuck Smith's take on it, and I would have to say that, yes, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as Chuck Smith did, but I, have to, I would have to say that it's probably the closest uh, thing to my own uh, spiritual position regarding tongues. I don't think they should be exercised all out loud in front of unbelievers because it becomes frightening to unbelievers. For the same way, I believe that when the Spirit of God is moving and with power, um, that, you know, barking like a dog, rolling on the floor, quivering and shaking and stuff, is completely un unnecessary. And, and uh, that is why, years ago, uh, I stopped... I mean, I lay hands on people. There's going to be a Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up, I think, uh, in a day or two. Uh, it's coming up uh, December 19th, Thursday, at 6 p.m. at the Sportsman's Lodge in um, um, Studio City. But the point is that I don't... Um, uh, oftentimes I'll pray with people and the power of God will come upon them I will never push somebody, and I discourage them from, quote, being slain in the Spirit. So I'll pray with somebody, but, um, and sometimes the power of God will come upon them, and they'll, but what will happen is I myself will, or I'll have an assistant, very subtly, without anybody noticing it, gently have them sit down. I, I, I don't allow, I mean, as m best as I can, people to be slain in the Spirit. Because what I've observed was then people come, a, a small percentage of people come to be slain in the Spirit. And then it becomes all about being slain in the Spirit. And that's not the Gospel. And I'll be really blunt. And I don't mean to be insulting. I believe God moves with power. I believe the Holy Spirit can come upon somebody. And please don't take this in the wrong way, but any fool can fall down slain in the spirit. And to do that repetitively week after week, that's not like communion, you know. And and I think it dishonors the Lord. I hope I made myself clear. I hope I'm not just getting myself in trouble. Okay, so what I want to say now is this. We are facing very intense, serious times in this nation. I hear people talk about the civil, uh, civil war breaking out. I think they need to be very careful about vocalizing that because there are powerful forces in, inciting on the left and inciting on the right and inciting among all the races. There are very powerful forces that would like to trigger a civil war in our nation for the purpose of establishing a police state, martial law, or a totalitarian government, order out of chaos, or manufactured crisis. I think we need to be very careful about that and be very wise and not bite the bait of giving in to our flesh and anger and resentment and, and, and negative reciprocity if bad things happen. On the other hand, I want to make this very clear. Jesus said, occupy until I come. I believe with all my heart that God has a prophetic destiny for America. I believe it is very short-sighted and a not, a not correctly uh, or rightly dividing the Word of God to falsely assume by taking Bible verses out of context that... Um, God's finished with America. God has a prophetic destiny for America to fulfill. In my book, 
the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, which you need to get, not because I'm just trying to sell a book. You need to get it because it's 374 pages that basically tells you, in my opinion, in the f most fast-moving, interesting way, what God's plan is for America, where we are now, and what God wants for the future. I don't know of any other book that, that delivers a payload like this. Sorry for sounding like I'm bragging, but I'm passionate about my own book. In The Greatest Battle, I explain the dynamic. The pilgrims and Puritans founded America. They entered into a supernatural covenant with God based on Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and curses. They dedicated America to God based on the covenant that the children of Israel made with God in Deuteronomy 28. When you read Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and curses, you see clearly that in the first two verses, that if God's people will not worship idols, but only worship the biblical God, and if God's people will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, which means they will read the Word of God diligently, they'll obey the Word of God diligently, then what God says in the very two first verses of Deuteronomy 28 is that he will raise that nation up above all the nations on planet Earth, with the exception that is Israel came into alignment with those demands and was raised up the only other nation on planet Earth, despite its imperfections, that has been supernaturally raised up above all the nations on planet Earth, there's only one nation. That's the United States of America. Not because we are better or nicer people, but because the pilgrims and Puritans who were strong Bible-believing Christians, who had a strong biblical worldview, who, by the way, the pilgrims and Puritans read books like crazy. And I'm not going to back off on this. There's just too many Christians that are dumb. Too many, not all ministers, but too many ministers that are dumb. Too many denomination people who are dumb. Being a Christian should not be synonymous with being stupid. I'm not being cruel. I'm not being disparaged. I'm just telling you like it is. It's, it's, it's shameful to God. Study to show thyself approved. Both the word and teach yourself. Become educated. Now, uh, the Pilgrims and Puritans were heavy-duty readers. Their kids were heavy-duty readers. They had to read. Their kids knew physics, advanced mathematics, multiple languages. They were students of the Old Testament and the New Testament. They, need, they knew Greek, Hebrew, Latin. They knew uh, government. They knew philosophy, secular philosophy, secular government. They knew the history of mankind and revolutions and what happened in Babylon and ancient Egypt. They were highly educated people, not because they were wealthy, but because they read books and they prioritized learning and education. You compare that with an almost impotent evangelical church in America that is powerless because they don't read, they don't have knowledge, and they have earbuds in their head, and they're going back and forth like a bunch of druggies, okay? They don't sit down and read, except, you know, two-year-old mentality books. They don't know anything about history. They don't know anything about economics. They don't know anything about anything. And then they wonder why people don't respect them. There's a price to knowledge, and you've got to pay it. So, God has a prophetic destiny for America. Somebody like me, and I don't resent it, it's my call from God, but somebody like me would not have to spend so much time explaining this if God's people were even remotely literate. So God made a prophetic covenant with the pilgrims and Puritans to use America for mighty purposes and for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the last days. Now, it is true, we did not keep the covenant perfectly. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. But it is also true that God honored our attempts to keep that covenant 
That's why we became the most economically prosperous nation on, on planet Earth. That's why we became the world's most powerful military. That's why we became the world's freest nation on planet Earth, even though all of this stuff is under attack today. That is why it's only America where you have a really valid freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, so on and so forth. It's only in America where it says, and the Creator, God, has given us certain inalienable rights such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No other nation says that. They can't because they're concentration camps that don't allow their people to advance. Only America has its foundation built on the reality of the personal creator God of the Bible. That's why it says, and the creator has given us certain inalienable rights. What does that mean? It means that God himself has given us inalienable rights. That means those are rights that are given to every man or woman alive by God. And because God gave us those rights, no man or woman has the right to take them away. No government has the right to take them away. And those rights include the right to life, liberty, and happiness. None of the European nations, none of the communist nations, none of the nations that came out of the French Revolution, which became the communist Marxist Revolution, none of those nations have even a degree of the freedom and prosperity that we have. And the difference between us and them is one fundamental fact. The, the whole foundation of America is built on the Bible and the reality of the Judeo-Christian God. The historians, the Marxists who've taken over the universities and the uh, uh, Orwellian media, they are constantly trying to revise our history and deny the biblical truth of our history. God has a prophetic destiny for America. So even though we're in the last day, this is the reason I wrote the book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Not because I needed to write another book. Only America has the freedoms left, the economy left, the kind of American can-do entrepreneurial spirit left in its people. Only America has the God-given power and the opportunity in this latter part of the last days to go into all the world and preach the gospel like it's never been bef done before. Only America has uh, the economic power to send evangelists and missionaries across the world. Only America has the power to make disciples of all nations because only America has the economy, the freedoms, and the Christian worldview. Even though it's been deteriorated, we still have a strong Christian worldview. So only America is equipped by God it, because it's, our, it's, it's in our DNA. Only America has been equipped by God for the uh, last day's prophetic purpose. And this is what God is calling America to do in the last days. This is what God is calling you to do and me to do and every true believer in Jesus Christ to do in the last days. This is what he's calling us to do. He's calling us to win souls by the hundreds of millions. Jesus Christ said, the fields are white for harvest, the labors are few. Jesus Christ is calling us to go across America and the world and bring in hundreds of millions and billions of souls in the greatest last day's soul harvest the world has ever seen. The primary prophetic destiny of America is that it would bring in the greatest last day's soul harvest before the end of the age in the history of the world. That's right. That's what our call is. That's why the spiritual war here is so intense. But in order for that to happen, God's people must repent before God, seek his face, be clothed with power from on high, stop playing games, and start obeying the Lord. You know what? Don't worry about whether the majority of Christians do that, because the majority of Christians are not going to do that. 
The fact of the matter is the majority of Christians in America, not all, not all, but the majority are going to be sitting on their posteriors, twiddling their thumbs, and they're going to miss this entire thing. They won't be involved in it. There will be, and there is being risen up, a remnant church right now. A remnant church is being risen up by God, which is a numerical minority. And they come from all denominations. This remnant church, which is sizable in, in, in numerical numbers, you're in the remnant church, or you wouldn't be listening to me. You see, you wouldn't be listening to me if you weren't already in the remnant church. The remnant church it loves God, is praying, is interceding, doing spiritual warfare attempting to walk with Jesus, seeking Christ. The remnant church is growing in America. It's spreading to young people virally like crazy. Um, the remnant church, it, it, it only matters if the remnant church, if the remnant church only represents 4% of the population or 8% of the population or 15% of the population or 20% of the population, the remnant church does not have to be a numerical majority. The remnant church simply has to be a minority that's on fire with the power of God and has the vision of God in it to make disciples of all nations, to bring in the last day's soul harvest, to spread revival from coast to coast and across the world, and to bring in billions of people in the last day's soul harvest. We are entering a time now, yes we are, where this talk of civil war, because there are people in the Illuminati, and don't think the Illuminati is, is fiction, that only, that only exposes your ignorance. People in the Illuminati, the, the dark occult forces, the globalist elite, they're trying to arouse uh, a civil war, okay? strife because they operate under the occult principle order out of chaos we operate under the kingdom of god principles we can ignite a revival and we're going to bring in the largest harvest of souls that the world has ever seen why because jesus said occupy until i come and before Jesus Christ comes, this is exciting. If this doesn't excite you, I don't know what does. I just feel like I've been ministering for hours here. I have no idea how many hours I've been ministering to nonstop. But I'll say this. Right now, I have been downloaded with the supernatural joy of the Lord. I've been working since early in the morning. And I am filled to overflowing with the supernatural joy of the Lord. And it's the joy of the Lord which is our strength. And I'm filled with power from on high. Do you see me acting like a lunatic? No. I'm in my right mind, totally rational. I just happen to be filled with the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. The reason I'm filled with the joy of the Lord, the reason I actually, on an experiential level, I feel the surging of God's power moving through my mortal being. I, I sense the rivers of living water flowing out of my inmost being, ministering to you, watching and listening. I sense the anointing and the incredible presence of the Lord pouring through the television cameras, pouring through your cell phone, your laptop, your television. I sense the rivers of living water pouring out upon you, bathing you, cleansing you, refreshing you, breaking bondages, and filling you, right? This is what I, what I sense very powerfully in the Holy Spirit. And this is not about uh, taking sides on a ridiculous theological argument. I sense the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you with a gentle force. And I sense the, the rivers of living water bathing you in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord is fortifying you, 
internally with his power, his glory, and his presence. And as the force, the quiet force, as the quiet force of the Lord's power edifies your inner man or and inner woman, as the Spirit of God clothes you with power from on high, as, as a last day's anointing comes upon you, these are not the words of emotionalism. This is the word... These are the words of a tangible, scientific, spiritual reality. As the presence of the Lord bathes you, as the glory of the Lord comes upon you, as the anointing of the Lord breaks yokes, as you're being fortified, built up, and edified within, what you are experiencing now is <coughs> a foretaste of the power of the revival that Jesus is sending before he sends the full revival. You're, you're experiencing a, a foretaste of that re revival. You're sensing a foretaste of that anointing in the name of Jesus Christ because God is breathing his dunamis life upon you and you're being built up. The word of God says, you know, they'll run and be weary. Or I'm misquoting this, so forgive me. I, I'm slightly fatigued because I've been ministering for hours. But they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. They will take up wings as eagles. See, the Lord is promising you as he pours out his revival on you, as he is now, that you will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint and you will take up wings as eagles. That means you will begin to fly, not physically, but in a spiritual sense, you will fly above your circumstances. Man, this is so powerful. This is so exquisite. This is so beautiful. It's, it's so marvelous. The Lord is good. And when we start sharing the goodness of the Lord, all kinds of things have happened. Ha happen. The secret for you to fulfill your destiny, because God has a prophetic destiny for you that he wants released, the secret of the Lord fulfilling his prophetic destiny for you is this, synchronization. Synchronization. When you choose to synchronize with the will, the intent, the plan and the purposes of God, it means you're lining up with him. It is when and only when that you line up with Jesus, that you receive a divine download, that you receive the supernatural favor of God, the supernatural wisdom of God, the supernatural provision of God, the supernatural healing of God, and the supernatural guidance of God, the very things you need to live a victorious life that often seem to be being withheld from you are withheld from you. Why? Because you're out of alignment. And you see, when you're out of alignment, it's like using any kind of electronic device. It's like if I take the, the battery charger out of my iPhone, it's out of alignment. The battery's going to die. I have to plug it in properly. That's called aligning it. When you plug yourself in properly to the power of God and to, the, to, to, to Jesus Christ, you're in alignment. And when you're in alignment, you're in obedience. And when you're in obedience, you're in synchronization. And then the fruit, uh, it, it, it explodes in your life, fruitfulness and anointing. This is what I want to close on and the burden that I have. It's a heavy burden because it's been my observation of walking with the Lord over 40-something years, 44 years at least. It's been my observation that most Christians that I've met and I'm not judging anybody. It's only for the grace of God goeth I. I'm not, I'm not better than anybody. This isn't false humility. I know that I'm not better than anybody else. 
And I know that it's the grace of God, unmerited favor. So don't think that I think I'm better than anybody else. I know that I'm not. But the thing that I've seen most often, and I would really like you to hear me, like, uh, like, let's just forget about the television camera and stuff. Let's just pretend we're sitting down in a Starbucks or, I don't know, someplace having a cup of coffee or whatever talking. And I just want to tell you this, okay? Because I believe if I tell you this and you receive this, and you catch on fire with this, it'll change your life forever. What I want to tell you is that what I've observed over the decades of living is that the secret, the great secret to the success that so many people would like to experience, the great secret to healing, I'm talking about healing of bodies, healing of minds, healing of marriages, healing from addiction, the great secret to overcoming adversity, sin, trial, tribulation, temptation. The great secret to, to keeping your head sane in the midst of a raging spiritual battle. Any one of you who's ever pursued the will of God knows what I'm talking about. Do you know what it's like to pursue the will of God? And literally, it's as if you're in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Vietnam all at the same time. It is a raging spiritual battle that is brutal, and it takes every drop of spiritual blood out of your system. Your mind is reeling. You, you suffer PSTD shock. Your head is spinning. I'm talking about those of you that know what it's like to walk through. This is what I'm talking about. Those of you that have been in spiritual warfare to such deep extent that you know what it's like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. I am not a fan of that place, but I, I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death and feared no evil. Okay? And many, many of you listening to me, you too have walked through the valley of the shadow of death and feared no evil. That is a nasty place, man. But God brought you through it, didn't he? He brought me through it. You may be in it now, and I want to tell you that if you're in it now, keep calling on Jesus. You won't be in it forever. He's not going to dump you in the valley of the shadow of death. 
that's the price tag of spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare is heavy, man, but the grace of God is more powerful. The spirit of God is more powerful than any spiritual warfare you can you can uh, experience. In fact, right now I feel a very very heavy anointing and burden to pray for some of you, because what I sense in the Holy Spirit is you are in a deep spiritual warfare. And it's very serious. And the f demonic forces have been raging against you and hammering against you. And, and horrible, evil things have happened to you. And I feel a quickening in my spirit to, to pray for you. I, you know, the gift of faith is a supernatural gift when in certain times uh, what will come up out of your inmost being is a supernatural gift of faith where all of a sudden supernaturally you're transformed into a person who simply prays for somebody but miraculously what happens when the gift of faith begins to operate in you you become like a, like an incredible hulk of spiritual faith you become you become a warrior like a hulk warrior the, the, the power of faith in you is so t tenacious <coughs> that it can tear up demonic kingdoms. And I don't normally operate, <coughs> I don't know anybody who constantly operates in the gift of faith, but <coughs> it's emerging in me now, and I'm going to pray that, I'm going to pray for you and everybody listening um, operating in the spiritual gift of faith. I've been talking so many hours in this one recording that my voice is starting to go. But that doesn't matter because effective prayer is not released due to the decibel tone of your voice, but whether or not you're praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to pray for you. I want to enter into this spiritual warfare with you as your friend, Paul McGuire, and as your partner, Paul McGuire. I want to look you in the eye and I want to pray for you under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to exercise the gift of faith on your behalf. Lord Jesus Christ, I praise you and I thank you for every single person who is reaching out with expectancy and in, in, in agreement with me in prayer right now. I want to pray for every person who, who feels weary and hopeless because of the demonic onslaught of, of the spiritual battle. I want to pray for every person that the enemy has come against over and over again. And uh, Father, I stand before you, my brother in Christ, my sister in Christ, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I stand before you and I pray this prayer operating in the gift of faith and I agree with your prayer to Jesus and in the power and in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ I demand with kingdom authority right now I demand that every demonic power every force of evil every principality and power every opposing force I take authority over you in the name of Jesus and I demand that you leave my brother and sister be gone in the name of Jesus. I break your attempted grip. I sever your grip in the name of Jesus. I take out the sword of the Spirit and I sever with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, any any technicals of the evil one that would attempt to moor itself to your body, soul, and spirit. I sever it and break it in the name of Jesus. And in the authority of Jesus Christ, I completely set you free from all demonic attack in the name of Jesus. I set you free in your physical body, in your emotional, psychological being. I set you free from PSTD. I set you free from memories. I set you free from the horror of abuse. I, I speak.
speak deliverance. I speak supernatural deliverance to you in the area of abuse right now in the name of Jesus. I speak supernatural deliverance to you in the area of addiction in the name of Jesus. I speak supernatural deliverance to you in the area of besetting sin in the name of Jesus. And I set you free in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that the balm of Gilead, that the healing oil of the Lord is upon you right now in the name of Jesus. And as the healing uh, oil of the Lord is being poured out on the top of your head and going down your body, by his stripes you are made whole. The healing oil of the Lord is being poured out on your body, soul, and spirit. And I speak a word of restoration of finances, restoration of employment, restoration of relationships, restoration of identity, restoration of purpose, and total restoration. And I say to you that the same uh, power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in your life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Finally, as we come together in synchronization, like the pilgrims and Puritans did, it's at that time when we line up in synchronization that we unlock the supernatural power of God and wisdom at a far, far higher level than what normally occurs in our life. And I'll give you an example. I wrote this is not just about Paul McGuire plugging his books, because a lot of these books here aren't even in print. I, I, I don't even I can't even offer them. I was going to talk about them, but it's a, that would be a diversion right now. In this book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, which, by the way, everything I predicted has come true so far, this book has a second volume called The Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017. It should be really, I should have titled it Volume 1 and Volume 2. So I made a mistake by calling the second volume 2016-2017, but that's what's on the cover. It's a completely different book, but it is the companion piece to this one. And it contains, this one gives the outlines of all the challenges and problems, but Volume 2, which is known as A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, contains the, the second volume, which contains all the supernatural answers from God's Word, etc., etc., on how to be victorious. And you need to get the two together to, to be helped. Two of the most important chapters of that book, which is called A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, and it's not by any means out of date, is I do a study of um, Joseph in Egypt, and I do a study of uh, the prophet Daniel, and how God raised up both of these men in occultic kingdoms. They had to go through incredible suffering. Uh, they both were like sold to be killed. But both of them, both the prophet Daniel and Joseph, were raised up to the highest positions of power and authority, one in, in the king of Babylon and the other in, in the court of Pharaoh. And in addition to that, both Joseph and Daniel, and I go into detail, each one of them had to deal with the approximately 300 heavy-duty, hardcore, occult, magic, sorcerer, clairvoyance, uh, heavy occultic advisors. Each king of Babylon and Pharaoh each had about 300 of hardcore, demonically possessed, really powerful uh, uh, Satanists, witches, the whole deal. Okay, And yet Daniel defeated them all. Yet Joseph defeated them all. But they had to mix with them. They couldn't hide. And uh, Daniel gave super supernatural solutions uh, that allowed God's people to be set free. But the key to Daniel turning the tide of the spiritual battle 
was when Daniel went before the Lord personally, and Daniel began to repent of his own sins, and then Daniel began to function as an intercessor and repent for the sins of um, uh, the children of Israel. Immediately after he did that, there was a titanic battle in the invisible realm, and the super angel Gabriel was able to break through, and he said to Daniel, look, he said, Daniel, we heard your prayer, but we've been in mortal combat in the invisible realm. Myself, Gabriel, uh, Michael, the archangel, we've been battling these territorial spirits, the prince of uh, uh, Grisha and the, the prince of Persia or Iran, they've been battling us. But then Gabriel said to Daniel, he said, from the moment you began to repent of your own sins to the moment you began to repent of the sins of God's people, that broke something open in the invisible realm and we were able to, to lock up, at least temporarily, uh, the prince of Grisha and the prince of Persia. And then Daniel was elevated to the chief advisor in the, in the courts of the king of Babylon, the mightiest empire in the world at the time. Now, um, Joseph sold into slavery. Potiphar's wife wanted to seduce him. He rejected her. He got put into prison. And there's all these heavy-duty occult advisors there. But uh, the Pharaoh's freaking out because the Pharaoh doesn't know it at the time, but the Pharaoh has a prophetic economic dream about the future economy and the future economic crash of the mightiest empire on planet Earth, Egypt. Joseph is raised up, and Joseph has to deal with the 300 occult advisors and magicians and sorcerers and wizards of Pharaoh. But only Joseph can supernaturally interpret the prophetic dream of Pharaoh. And that prophetic dream was a economic dream where, where Joseph explained to Pharaoh, you're going to have seven years of economic plenty, seven years of, of harvest, seven years of good weather, and then immediately following that, you're going to have seven years of economic collapse, uh, no food supplies, and total devastation. So, God, th that's not just it. it God gave um, Joseph a supernatural plan, and he devised something that was never devised before. He used the first seven years to build gigantic warehouses, probably the size of Super Bowl stadiums, which contained massive warehouses of grain during the years of plenty, and then water supplies and all kinds of supplies. And uh, Joseph was raised up to be basically Pharaoh. He's the second command. He had the authority ring of Pharaoh, rode Pharaoh's chariot. He was like Pharaoh number two. And uh, he was, God gave him wisdom to multiply wealth. Remember that, multiplying wealth. So what um, Joseph did is he went to all the neighboring nations and they were, and he scouted them out because there was a lot of terror. Even though Egypt was a massive uh, empire, there was many powerful nations around Egypt. So when the days of the famine came, uh, through Joseph, they had these massive Superdome, Astrodome warehouses that were secured from heat, sun, etc. And uh, they had all this grain. And, and guess what? In a time of devastation, money, excuse me, food is money. The ability to eat is money. Never forget that. So, so what happened was... Um, God raised him up, and he was able to keep Israel alive and his brothers alive. He was able to keep the Jews alive. That's what was primary purpose. 
is he gave food to keep the Jew, his, the Jews alive, his brothers alive, and he had to forgive them too. But then, using the wisdom of God, he went to to all the the powerful nations surrounding Egypt, who were starving to death, and he made a deal with them. He said, "I'll I'll sell you grain and food so you can survive, in return." that you sell us massive acreage of your land at very, very, very discounted prices. So Joseph ended up expanding the geographic size of the Egyptian empire massively because he paid them in grain, which kept them alive, but they were, he drove a hard bargain because, because they had to either buy it or starve to death. So they, w they sold him huge portions of their empires. So he, f he physically expanded the, the, the empire of Egypt beyond anything you could possibly imagine. Now you see a pattern here between uh, Daniel, Joseph, and then King Solomon. God comes to King Solomon and says, you know, what can I do for you? I'll do anything you want me to do. Because remember, King Solomon has become king after King David. And King Solomon's prayer to God was, the only thing I ask you, God, is that you give me wisdom so that I might lead your people rightly. Let's pay attention to that. That's syncing up with the law of motive. That's syncing up to the purposes of God. Just like Joseph did. Just like Daniel did. And God was so impressed because God said to King Solomon, usually, I'm paraphrasing, it's in, it's in, I explain it in, in much more detail with many more truths in my book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017. But the thing is that um, God says to him, you know, whenever I ask this prayer to somebody, they always say, make me rich and famous, make me wealthy, make my, you know, it's always a self-centered prayer. The person that God is willing to give anything to, they ask God for all these riches and fame for themselves. You know, give me another 10,000 wives, you know, that type of thing. All right, so, so God says to, um, um, Solomon, because you did not ask me for wealth and gold so you could make yourself richer, and because you did not ask me for fame so that you could just, you know, strut around, but because you asked me for wisdom so that you might lead my people rightly, the Lord said to him, that prayer told me, I'm paraphrasing, that I could trust you because you're, you're, you're a man whose heart is after me like his father was. And he said to Solomon, he said, because you didn't ask me for riches so you could spend it on yourself, because you didn't ask me for uh, uh, fame just so you could be important, but you asked me only for wisdom so you could lead my people rightly, the Lord said, because of that, I am going to make you the wealthiest man who's ever lived, and I am going to make you fam the, the, the world's most famous man who's ever lived. And so, because Solomon's heart was synced up to the purposes of God, not his selfish desires, God raised up Solomon to be the wealthiest man in the history of the human race. The Rothschilds are beggars compared to the wealth of King Solomon. Um, the wisdom of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba sought him out. Kings and queens would travel across the world to seek out his counsel and a answers. He, what he did was phenomenal. And he expanded the empire of Israel. It became wealthier and wealthier and wealthier and more powerful and more powerful. The problem was that when Solomon got old, he 
I mean, I forgot. Him and his son David had not only a thousand wives each, this is an estimate, and a thousand concubines. And I can only think, by the way, I don't want to get into a sidetrack of why God allowed it. I'm going to theorize. I don't think it was so that they could indulge themselves carnally. That would be a violation of God's prioritization of marriage. My only theory is, and it's just a theory, is that God allowed that because both so- because the kings of Israel and other mighty men of Israel were men of such wealth and power, especially Solomon and David, this is just a theory, is that he allowed them to have a thousand concubines and a thousand wives as, as a protective means to taking care of these women from young femininity to their death that they would be fed for, provided for, clothing and shelter, etc. That that is my theory, because otherwise it would be contradictory to the Word of God. Because remember, both Solomon and David and Israel were often involved in warfare. Uh, there was a huge shortage of men, in the sense that um, uh, there weren't enough husbands to go around. And if there were not enough husbands to go around, you would have had thousands of women. Uh, with nobody to take care of them. That's my theory. And I don't want to get sidetracked. If you have a, uh, if you happen to know a better answer, just send me an email. I'd be interested in, in reading. If it's if you've s- researched it, I'd be interested in reading what you have to say. Um, so in each case, they lined up with the purposes of God. Now let's take this back to America. God has a prophetic destiny for America. If America lines up with God's prophetic destiny and doesn't allow itself to be seduced by socialism, Marxism, and other antichrist philosophies or the teaching of the Frankfurt School Marxists, which I talk about all of this, you've really got to get up to speed about it in my book, The Greatest Battle. You've got to know what I'm talking about. Not because it's i got an ego, but, but we can't progress unless you understand what's going on. Um, unless America lines up. Because one of the most important things I say in The Greatest Battle is I talk about Sir Francis Bacon, the head of the Rosicrucians, the head of the occult. And there was a secret occult plan for America. Sir Francis Bacon, big super scientist and occult leader, spiritual advisor to the Queen of England, snuck in boats with the Pilgrims and Puritans, and secretly snuck in with the Pilgrims and Puritans, members of the occult and the Rosicrucians, because he wanted to see America to become like this occult. No, what actually Sir Francis Bacon's plan for America was to make it the head of the New World Order and to make it the New Atlantis. So he, he infiltrated the godly Pilgrims and Puritans when they first settled. I explain that in this book. Now, the other thing is that um, there was a secret occult plan for America. You look at the architecture of Washington, D.C. It shrieks with, with architecture that symbolizes the secret occult plan of America. Sir Francis Bacon's vision of America being the new Atlantis is all over America for being the head of the New World Order. The occultic New World Order is all over America. There's t- there was two destinies for America since the beginning. I explain it to you in this book. I explain it to you in Conquering the Matrix, where mind control and sorcery is a key feature. I explain it to you in A Prophecy of the Future of America. And this book, Doug Hagman wrote the forward to Mass Awakening, will kick you in the posterity because this book is about to explode on the streets of America any minute. A scientifically engineered mass awakening, in other words, manufactured crisis or order out of chaos. So, God has a prophetic destiny for America, established by the pilgrims and Puritans. The powers of darkness, the devil is fighting it with everything he possibly can. That doesn't matter. When, when, if we fight the devil, 
in our ordinary human strength and power, we're going to lose. Period. End of story. We might as well pack it up and go home. America's prophetic destiny and your own personal prophetic destiny and your family's prophetic destiny will never be released. But if we fight this spiritual battle in the power of the Holy Spirit, the way the Apostle Paul taught us to, for our weapons are... Um, I'm, I'm, forgive me, my brain is going soft. I've been ministering so long to you. Um, for the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If we fight not with carnal weapons, not losing our temper, not biting the bait and being seduced into some kind of violent revolution, which then they will use as a propaganda circus to say Christian right-wing extremists are violent, that would be a dumb thing to do. Don't bite the bait in times of crisis. Maintain your composure or stay home. Um, the key is, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, using the wisdom of God, if we use the weapons of our warfare, which are mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, and we learn how to pray an intercessory prayer where we're using supernatural power, not just physical human power, we're, we're using supernatural uh, methods of wealth production. You say, well, I don't believe that. That sounds like the prosperity gospel. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is a gospel that got into false teaching. I'm not a false teacher, okay? I'm not, preach I'm not going to preach to you a, a, a false teaching gospel that got off track. I never did and I never will. But just because they got off track does not mean that, is, that it's not apparent from Genesis to Revelation that it's God's will to prosper his people if certain conditions are met. And that doesn't mean sitting at home and just blabbing it and grabbing it. It means working. It means education. It means praying, etc., etc. So the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God is not joking when he says... He gives his people the power to make wealth. It's not a joke. It takes money to fight a spiritual battle. It takes money to fight a, a physical battle. Wars cost a fortune. Spiritual wars cost a fortune. When God says he gives you the power to get wealth, and when you read Deuteronomy 28 and you read the rest of the scripture, it becomes very, very clear and very, very apparent that if your life is synced up with God, which simply means if you abide in me and I abide in you, then ask me whatever you will and it will be done for you. If you're synced up with the Lord, if you're abiding with the Lord, then you can expect rightfully that the Lord will give you the supernatural ability to make wealth. But here's the thing. He's not going to give you the supernatural ability to make wealth if all you're going to do is spend it on yourself. Sometimes he allows that to happen. I'm not saying he doesn't allow it to happen, because he does. But most of the time he doesn't. Remember what he said to Solomon. Because you didn't ask me for wealth to spend it on yourself, because you didn't ask me to make your name great just so you could be famous, or you didn't ask me to just make you smart so you could, you know, outmaneuver everybody for yourself, but because you asked me, Solomon, for wisdom that you might lead my people rightly, I will make you the wealthiest man who ever lived, and I will make you the wisest man who ever lived. That syncs up with it's God that gives us the power to get wealth. That syncs up with the blessing and cursing promises in Deuteronomy 28. You see, when we're synced up with God, God trusts us, and God will, what he'll do is take our natural talents and abilities, assuming we apply ourselves, our 
intention, intentionality in self-education because we bother to read books, not just watch, you know, some stupid TV show. If, if you're sitting home with a six-pack of beer, and I don't care if you drink beer or not. I don't drink anything. That doesn't make me better than you. But if you're sitting at home with a six-pack of beer watching Worldwide Federation of Wrestling and other, other deeply educational programs, I'm just going to flat out and tell you, I mean, it's, a, it's because I love you, brother, but look, really, let's get real. You're, you're on the path, and you're already there, of being a moron. Now, I hate to break it to you, you already know that. So, the reason you're doing it, and I'm not picking on you, because I understand your mentality. The reason you're doing it is you're trying to kill the pain. You're trying to unstress from stressful life and stressful jobs. I, I got that. You're not sitting around knocking down six-packs and, and watching worldwide. I don't even know. Is World Feder Worldwide Federation of Wrestling still on? I have no idea. I was never a fan to begin with. <laughs> but if you're knocking down six-packs and, and watching something like that, yeah, you're going nowhere. But I understand why you're doing it. You're trying to kill the pain temporarily. You're trying to just chill out out from the stress. I got it. But what if I could promise you, but you got to get rid of your, your negative preconceptions. What if I could promise you that you could get turned on, you, that you could get a higher high, more turned on, more relaxed, more fun, more power, more payoff, doing some of the things that I'm suggesting from the Bible that you do. What if I could promise you that when I'm telling you that the Bible is promising you is a thousand times more of a turn-on than whatever you're into, which is causing you to miss God's perfect will for your life. Would you do it then? You're skeptical. Okay, I understand you're skeptical. I'd be skeptical too. Well, I can promise you it's a hundred times, a thousand times more of a turn on. And on top of that, you get the benefit of the, of the growth, uh, of the productivity. Just think about that. But if you're going to sit on your butt watching Worldwide Federation of Wrestling and drinking the six-pack all the time, I can't help you. you got to at least say, you know, I am, I am going to sit, because I'm going to talk to you like a, in a realistic way and not like just lie to you because... Why should I lie to you and have you lie to me? I'm not stupid. And you're not stupid. So here's the thing. We both know you're not going to get off the couch all at once, stop drinking you know, a six-pack a day, and, and stop watching all these TV shows, which, which are just like making your brain a big bowl of jelly. We both know that's not going to happen because you have, a, you have a legitimate desire to chill out. I got it. But you could start by taking one day a week, would that be fair, for like three hours or four hours, break your normal routine of the six-pack and whatever you're watching that's causing you to just like have a brain like jello. So, so you start one day a week, four hours a day. And I would suggest starting to read the Bible in like a New King James Version, one you can understand. Read one of my books that are high-powered if you want. If you don't want to buy a book, go to my website, paulmcguire.us. Start listening to the radio program and some of the videos. At first, you're not going to comprehend and get everything. That's okay. What will happen, though, as you expose your brain through your eye, your ears, to the material I'm going to present to you, your brain switches will turn on. That's the way God constructed the brain. You're going to have to trust me on this. Your brain switches will turn on. You don't have to turn them on. They will turn on if you'll take that baby step of four hours. They'll turn on, and your brain will automatically, neurologically, at a high speed, it will make you more intelligent and more intelligent and more intelligent 
more intelligent at a very high speed. All you have to do is do an input of four hours a day once a week. And then you build from there. Now, if you will do that and then increase the time, but what I'm telling you is you will see results in that ramp up launching stage because you're going to be turning switches on in your brain which is going to flood your brain with new very powerful biochemicals your brain's going to create new neurological pathways of information and electrical impulses and you're going to experience a power coming into you and out of you that you have never experienced or haven't experienced in a long, long time. And this is where it gets good. If you will ride with that just long enough, what will happen is you it won't even be a battle. You won't want to sit with your posterior watching some stupid thing, drinking a six-pack a day or smoking whatever you're smoking, which you shouldn't be smoking, whether it's legal or not, you're not going to want to do that because you're going to be turned on to something higher, more potent, and more powerful. God's no respecter of persons. You're listening to me talk. I have talked to countless guys and girls just like you all over the United States. And I have seen God do things in lives like people like you and women like you and men like you that is so far beyond anything I could have ever conceived. It's mind-blowing. But you've got to do something. You just give them, give them some time, man. Four hours, okay? En enough on that. If you do that, I promise you results. And you know you're supposed to do anyway. So why don't you just quit BSing God and, and if you're upset, somebody that I'm saying BSing, look, grow up. You're a big girl, a big guy. This is the way they talk and work. This is the way they talk in the street. And they're not as polite as I am. They don't n use the initials. They use the actual B word and the S word. So give me a break and don't be so holy and act like you're offended that I said BS. That is a very tame. I mean, get over it. Unless you've never worked a real job because they say a lot worse than that. You try that, you'll never turn back. So the, the whole thing I'm saying is God ha has a commitment to America, a prophetic destiny. God has a, pro a commitment to you. And you're essential to the prophetic destiny. But, you know, there's a term, you know, great awakening. It's when a massive revival happens. Well, what, what is a great awakening? A great awakening is when you start to become awakened when I start to become awakened with the power of God and everything else. And once that supernatural energy begins to rip through you, it's a turn on, man. I'm telling you, it is a flat out turn on. And it's a high too. I mean, it's a legal high, but it's high. It's higher than smoking pot. I don't care whether you're going. California's got pot everywhere. I don't smoke pot in California. And look, if you have some strange medical condition, I'm not knocking you for doing whatever you got to do to deal with it. But I'm just saying, Spirit of God, <laughs> people don't give up. Why do you think millions of people have given up certain things to walk with the Lord? Because the Lord didn't make them high and happy? No, because God's good. He wants to bless you. So here's the deal. I'm going to close out with this. I spoke at a conference uh, called the Disclosure Conference in the um, uh, Costa Mesa area of California. I was struck by the fact that about 65% of the people there were millennials, a little bit older, very young crowd. Revival was blowing through there. They were hungry for God. They were on fire for God. There's a turning going on. There's the faithful older remnant who've been holding this whole thing together. You know who you are. 
You've been praying for everybody. You've been standing in the gap. I know who you are. Okay, You've been supporting this ministry faithfully. But I'm telling you, I'm seeing a breakthrough now in the emails, texts, and the people that I'm meeting. And it's far younger people. Okay, And that's good. Because if it wasn't for the faithfulness of those of you that are older, we wouldn't have been able to reach these young people. And, the, and what's happening now is the young people are at a turning point all across the United States. They are wising up to being lied to. They're not buying the media lies as much. What I see is they're hungry for God. What I suspect is that they're on the verge of a massive revival. So our job is to keep feeding them with that spiritual input to ignite that spiritual revival. Now, that requires finances. It requires prayer warriors, intercessory prayer warriors. <coughs> it, it, I cannot tell you how important it is for you to send these messages far and wide by sending your own links. I'm telling you flat out, heavy stuff is coming in America. They're going to censor viciously Christian stuff, conservative stuff. Uh, they're going to drop them off social media left and right. That's why we're setting up to transition you. I I'm giving you a heads up to go with us. We're already on Brideon. Many other people are going on Brideon, uh, Brideon.com now. Okay? <coughs> because you're going to wake up one morning <coughs> and a lot of people you like to hear and watch are going to be no longer available on some of the big tech giant controlled, deep state controlled uh, social media. So get in the habit, break the habit of going to, the, to some of these old things, migrate with us over to brighteon.com and stuff because I can't control what's happening. All I know is it's from inside sources, it's happening quickly. You know why it's happening quickly? You can figure out why. We're X amount of months away from something, and they're going to shut down all communication. So, if you want to be fed and if you want to be connected, you've got to do stuff like become a follower of the different social media, but join Brighteon. Go to my you, look, sign up to be on the e blast list. The, the reason is that's my only way of automatically. Even if you don't read it, I don't care. It's my only way of keeping in contact with you when this stuff happens, and it's going to happen soon. All right? So, I want to finish with this. God has a plan for your life. I know this has been long, but I have never been more excited, more confident, more laser-like focus in my commitment to what God has called us to do. You and I are going to see two things happen. We're going to see, I don't know if we're going to see a civil war violently. We may, because there's powerful people who are going to do everything they can to stir it up. We need to pray and bind that from happening and not fall into the seduction of it. But there's going to be an all-out war. They're going to be shutting down all kinds of media that communicate the truth. These people are, they want total control. So that's going to be going on. But at the same time that's going on, God is going to be raising up individuals like you, people. God's going to be raising up ministries. And God's going to be pouring out His Holy Spirit and revival in a way that you have, haven't have seen in a long time in America. It's going to be the best of times, but it's going to be the worst of times. For you, it can be the best of times. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. I want to thank every one of you for being a faithful uh, prayer warrior with this ministry. And I want to thank every one of you for um, uh, sending the links out because they are censoring. They're dirty on the censoring too, folks. Sending the links out so we can do an end run around their censorship. And I want to thank God for every one of you who seek the Lord and know the urgency of the spiritual battle that we're in, and you really ask uh, God, how much do you want me to contribute to 
Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church. And whatever God tells you to do, you obey him because you're lined up right. And if it's some large gift that's unexpected, you'll do that. Or if it's just a faithful, regular, small gift of 10 or 15 or $25, again, it all adds up. Every person gives according to the way God has blessed them to give. And it's, it's combined we can generate uh, the resources uh, to do what we need to do. But also, I'm very concerned about you. I'm very concerned that the Lord multiplies and expands you and grows you and answers your prayers because this is a partnership where you and I uh, are together. And so um, I, I need to know in my spirit that we're giving you the tools and information to experience breakthrough, to experience God's provision, to experience God's healing. Um, I, I feel that I w- would have failed if I have not appropriately taught you the Word of God uh, to such an extent that you, that you can transition and, and be victorious. Not that we all won't have continual trials t- until we get to heaven, because we will. But, I, but, I, but my prayers are for you, and I want my teaching and ministry directed in such a way that you're being set free and being built up. God bless you, I'm Paul McGuire, and remember this, Jesus Christ is Lord. He's King of Kings, and he's Lord of Lords, and he's coming back soon. 